primary immunodeficiency disorders. You'll see that a lot of these disorders run along the same themes. A lot of them have uh, recurrent sinopulmonary infections. A lot of them are treated with IVIG or some of them require bone marrow transplant. Um, so it's important to be able to differentiate between them. Some of them have some pretty standout features and sometimes those features are, are in the name. Uh, but otherwise, this video will help you differentiate between the primary immunodeficiency disorders. So let's get started. Um, I've listed all the disorders we'll talk about uh, on the left here, and this is how I group them in my head. The ones in blue here are B cell deficiencies. Uh, they result in problems with humoral immunity. The one in red is a T cell deficiency. It has a problem with cellular immunity. There are combined lymphocyte deficiencies, so humoral and impaired um, T cell T cell deficiency, that's these three right here. You have phagocytosis deficiencies, that's these four in green, and complement deficiencies, those are these last two in yellow. So we'll go through them one by one, I'll tell you the highlights, let's get started. So first we have selective IgA deficiency. This is the most common antibody deficiency. To diagnose it, you look for low IgA levels, which makes sense um, given the name. Everything else should be normal, uh, IgG will be normal, IgM is normal, and B cells are normal. This is related to common variable immunodeficiency, which we'll talk about later. Um, there's an arrest of B cell differentiation that leads to low IgA levels. This will present with recurrent mouth, airway, and respiratory and GI infections. Um, you'll treat these infections with antibiotics. You'll um, remember that IgA is the antibody of the mucous membranes, so it makes sense that these tissues are the ones getting infected. Um, IgM still works, so many patients don't even have this. Many patients are healthy, asymptomatic, undiagnosed, and this is benign. Where this does come up um, sometimes is with rapid, severe anaphylactic reaction following a transfusion of blood or IVIG. Um, what's going on here is that the person who does not have IgA is making anti-IgA antibodies against the new foreign IgA um, that's in the blood that was just transfused. If this happens, you stop the transfusion, you give them IM epinephrine, with bronchodilators if they need it, with antihistamines if they need it. <clears throat> you can also add pressors and mechanical ventilation. And if necessary, you can give IgA depleted IVIG. So this is a rare presentation of IgA deficiency, but it might come up on a board question or you know it might come up in the hospital as well. So that's selective IgA deficiency. Next is hyper IgM syndrome. Um, here, the pathophysiology is similar. Antibody class switching does not work. The problem here specifically is the CD40 ligand, and the absence of that CD40 ligand means that the antibody class switching does not work. Um, so to diagnose this, you again look at the Igs, your immunoglobulins, your immunoglobulin M is high, and the rest are low. There's usually minimal non-selective defense with IgM, so they're, like IgA, have increased susceptibility to recurrent sinopulmonary infections. Um, viruses and encapsulated bacteria. The treatment here is scheduled IVIG um, for these people. Next is X-linked agammaglobulinemia, also called Bruton's agammaglobulinemia. Pathophysiology, this is X-linked, so you'll see it in males. There's a BTK gene that has mutated, and if you have a defective Bruton tyrosine kinase, you'll have impaired B-cell maturation and immunoglobulin production. The signs and symptoms, again, recurrent sinopulmonary and GI infections. You have a deficiency in opsonizing IgG, so this means that you'll have recurrent otitis, sinusitis, pneumonia. So the encapsulated bugs you might get are, you know, uh, strep pneumo and haemophilus influenza. You can also get pseudomonas as well. The symptoms here usually begin around three to six months, and this is because your maternal transplacental IgG has faded by then. So you'll uh, You'll be a baby that starts to get um, sick when mom's protection ends around three to six months. They might have small lymphoid tissue, so small tonsils, small adenoids, small spleen, small lymph nodes, um, which is where the, the B cell action usually happens. They also get chronic enteroviral infections, and they I mean, have a deficient antibody response. That's kind of um, explained already. The diagnosis is made um, first by looking at the IgEs and noticing that everything is low. You can confirm with flow cytometry and see that the B cells are low. The T cells will be normal, they might even be high. Uh, they might not tell you that the B cells are low. They might just say that CD20 positive cells are low. Um, and you should know that CD20 positive cells corresponds to B cells. So that's the deficiency here, uh, B cell deficiency. Treatment is scheduled IVIG or subcutaneous IG. Um, you can also do prophylactic antibiotics as well 
Next is common variable immunodeficiency. This is CVID. Uh, pathophysiology is abnormal differentiation. Um, B cell is not able to differentiate into the plasma cell. Therefore, you have decreased immunoglobulin production. The presentation here is in adults, which makes it unique among many of the ones on this list. Um, usually 15 to 35, some sources say 20 to 40 years old, um, but it can even be earlier, as early as puberty. It affects males and females. Again, they'll have respiratory infections. They'll have GI infections. I've listed some of the bugs for that here. Um, there's a chronic presentation in the lungs after you have recurrent um, infections, and they might end up with bronchiectasis or fibrosis. Uh, same scenario in the GI tract. If you have chronic GI infections, they might end up with an IBD-esque um, picture with chronic inflammation and chronic diarrhea. This is kind of a less severe form of X-linked agammaglobulinemia that we just talked about. Um, you need at least two of these to make the diagnosis, so uh, you need to be deficient in two of IgM, IgA, and IgG. These people will have no response to vaccines, so they might get infected with something they've been vaccinated against. Um, they, again, upper and lower respiratory tract infections, normal number of B cells, but a deficient antibody production. Uh, treatment's the same, IVIG, maybe prophylactic antibiotics. Okay, this one is uh, a little different, <clears throat> has some distinct features. So this is DeGeorge syndrome, also called 22Q11.2 deletion. Pathophysiology here is that the thymus has not formed properly. Um, it's also called velocardiofacial syndrome, and it's autosomal dominant. The mnemonic to help you remember the features for DeGeorge syndrome is CATCH-22. The C stands for cardiac defects. They often have a tetralogy of Fallot, a truncus arteriosus, or a VSD, a ventricular septal defect. The A stands for abnormal facial features. Um, here's a kid that has it. He has micronathia, wide-spaced eyes, and low-set ears. Thymic aplasia, this will be something you notice on an x-ray. They'll have an absent thymic shadow. Um, this corresponds to the T-cell deficiency. Remember this red was the only one that was T-cell deficiency. Um, these are combined, so these will also have T-cell deficiency. Uh, and the C stands for cleft palate and craniofacial abnormalities. The H stands for hypocalcemia from hypoparathyroidism. This can actually lead to seizures and newborn tetany. And the 22 at the end of the catch-22 reminds you that this happens in chromosome 22Q11. Um, the, the, I guess more details on the pathophysiology, there's a defective development of the pharyngeal pouches, and that's why some of these are all kind of in that area. The hypoparathyroidism, the thymic aplasia, the abnormal facial features is all from defective pharyngeal development. Oh, sorry, pharyngeal pouch development. Symptoms, like the others, you'll have recurrent infections with viruses, fungus, um, PCP. This is kind of a, an AIDS picture, an HIV AIDS picture, because they kind of have the same problem. They have a T-cell deficiency. The treatment here is PCP, PCP prophylaxis, which is Bactrim. That's, um, that's what you would do in AIDS as well. You can do a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplant um, and IVIG as well. The cure is to transplant the thymus, so essentially replace what they are missing. Next is severe combined immunodeficiency. Pathophysiology here is a gene defect. Oftentimes it's the adenosine deaminase. Um, deficiency, and that leads to failed B T cell development, which then leads to failed B cell dysfunction. Um, so the this is this can be autosomal dominant, or it could be sorry autosomal recessive or X-linked recessive. If you want a picture in your head for what Skid looks like, uh, think of Bubble Boy, who has no immune system and needs to be surrounded and needs to be protected from germs all the time. The symptoms, again, are recurrent sinopulmonary infections starting at six months. Um, again, six months is when, you're, uh, when your mom's immunity starts to fade, and um, this one's also functionally similar to AIDS. They'll get infections that are bacterial, that are opportunistic, like PCP, crypto, candida, toxoplasmosis, TB, herpes, chickenpox, CMV, and PML. They have chronic diarrhea. They have failure to thrive. These people are getting infected all the time. Again, the only cure is a transplant, so this time you want to replace the bone marrow, um, do a stem cell transplant. You want to put, have these people on prophylaxis, and you can give them IVIG as well um, for that temporary protection. So these next two are nice because they have some distinct features. Let's start with Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. This is an X-linked recessive defect in the WAS protein gene. This only happens in males because it's X-linked. This is uh, uh, this, a deficiency in this protein causes impaired cytoskeleton changes in white blood cells and platelets. You can remember the features of Wiscott Aldrich with the mnemonic WIPE. The W stands for Wiscott Aldrich, because that's what we're talking about. The I stands for infections. They have recurrent infections. The thrombocytopenic purpura, the P for purpura, um, 
that's a result of having low uh, platelets, so they'll have purpura, like you see in this picture here. This kid has um, some spots on his face and his forehead. They have eczema as well, so that's the E in wipe. Um, eczema, you can see that on his toe here and kind of his uh, dorsal foot in figure B. So they'll also have bleeding and hematomas, like kind of bigger bleeds in the purpura. You can see under his eyes, he has a bit of bleeding. Um, and the infections, recurrent ear infections, atopic diseases, that's the eczema. So the IGs here, they'll actually have high IgE uh, to A ratio, and they'll have low IgM and thrombocytopenia, just like that name implies. Um, the cure again is a transplant. You can do a splenectomy uh, for them as well. Unfortunately, there are low survival rates for this, but what to remember for Wiscott Aldrich, wipe. Wiscott Aldrich, infections, purpura, eczema, um, those three or four features are what you need to know. Next is ataxia telangiectasia. Um, this one's also nice because it's in the name. Um, they have cerebellar ataxia. This is essentially how a drunk person behaves. They'll have incoordination, stumbling, falling, and slurred speech. Uh, they are not coordinated, that's ataxia. They'll also have oculocutaneous telangiectasia. That's what I'm depicting here. This is ocular form, this is on the skin. Um, <clears throat> this kind of branching pattern of blood vessels, telangiectasia. It's a recessive disease. The problem here is a DNA repair. Um, <clears throat> deficiency, so these people are also predisposed to malignancies. That's an important association to know. Um, they have an IgA deficiency here, and they'll also get sinopulmonary infections. There's no specific treatment, it's just about the same. IVIG, give them prophylactic antibiotics and antibiotics for when they get infected. Next, now we're in the um, phagocytosis disorders. So let's start with chronic granulomatous disease. So the pathophysiology here, it's X-linked recessive. This is a deficiency in NADP, sorry, NAPDH. No, this is, this is wrong, NADPH oxidase. Um, and because you have a deficiency in that, you have low production of anion superoxides. Essentially, the, the macrophages can eat other cells, um, but they can't kill catalase-positive organisms. So they can ingest, but not digest. Um, instead, they'll create granulomas, and they'll start eating each other and make this big, massive mass of, uh, of macrophages that sits there instead. Symptoms, you'll get respiratory GI, um, urinary tract infections, skin infections, granulomas, um, all kinds of gra granulomas everywhere. They can also cause ulcerations. The most common organisms you'll see here are catalase positive. Uh, catalase positive organisms are able to overcome the, the eating of the, of the macrophages. That includes like staph, aspergillus, burkholderia, nicardia, serratia. The immune system is still responding, so they'll have you know normal IgEs, normal uh, white blood cell, and appropriate increases in these when you have an infection, but they still can't clear the infection. This is a little different and important to know. The diagnosis is made by measuring the neutrophil superoxide production. There are a couple ways to do this. The, the I think best way to do it now is with flow cytometry and a test for dihydrorhodamine. Um, and if that's deficient, then it's chronic granulomatous disease. An older test that's still used sometimes is the nitro blue tetrazoleum test, and you'll see a negative respiratory burst on that test, um, and that'll suggest chronic granulomatous disease. The treatment is daily Bactrim, again, prophylaxis. They need antifungals like itraconazole, and interferon gamma can help here as well. The cure, like the others, is bone marrow transplant. Next, leukocyte adhesion deficiency. Pathophysiology here is CD. 18 um, is defective. This is an integrin that impairs leukocyte chemotaxis. So we know CD18 is associated with leukocyte adhesion deficiency. Remember that your B cells were associated with CD20. So those are some, some things to remember from, from these slides. Um, here, the neutrophils can't ad adhere to the blood vessels and they can't exit the blood vessels. So extravasion, which is depicted in this picture here, is impaired. Um, this means that bacteria will proliferate in the tissues. Um, the body will have an appropriate response and have high leukocytes in the blood, um, as shown in these lab values. They'll have high leukocytes, high white blood cells, high cytokines, high IgM, high IgG. The, the leukocytes just can't get through um, into the tissues. So um, it's unfortunate, and then the bacteria just proliferates here, and they end up with uh, an infection. There's interestingly no pus in the wounds because the uh, neutrophils aren't able to get there. The other sign that you might see in newborns is a delayed separation of the umbilical stump. Um, so normally that comes off pretty quickly. This, in this disease, it might come off uh, after several weeks. 
cure here, like the others, is bone marrow transplant. Next one, Chidaic Higashi syndrome. So this one's autosomal recessive. It's a deficiency in neutrophil chemotaxis. Um, the lysosomes end up fusing together, and they create these large granules in the neutrophils. Um, this is a picture of one of those granules. It's called a dole body, and it's pretty characteristic, so be able to recognize this on a blood smear. Um, the neutrophils are low in this disorder, and it has some pretty characteristic findings. It causes a peripheral neuropathy, albinism of the skin and eyes, so they'll have white eyes, white skin, and uh, reddish eyes. Um, neutropenia, the treatment is the same as the others, bone marrow transplant, and antibiotic syndrome. But associate neuropathy, albinism, neutropenia with Chidaic Higashi syndrome. Hyper IgE, or Job syndrome. Pathophysiology here is an autosomal dominant defect in JAK stat signaling, which impairs TH17 and leads to impaired neutrophil chemotaxis and proliferation. The mnemonic here is FATED, F A T E D. So the F stands for facies, coarse facies. These people have prominent forehead and a broad nose. The A stands for abscesses. They have abscesses that are cold and non inflammatory. So just like the other disorders, they have recurrent sinopulmonary infections. Um, but these abscesses are non-inflammatory. They contain Staph aureus and Candida. The body's not able to, to clear the infection. The T stands for teeth. They have retained primary teeth. E stands for IgE and eosinophilia. Um, there's hyper-IgE in hyper-IgE syndrome. Makes sense. And lastly, derm. There are some derm manifestations like chronic severe eczema. Um, so the fated is coarse facies, dry, or sorry, cold, non-inflammatory abscesses, retained primary teeth, hyper IgE and eosinophilia, and derm manifestations like chronic eczema. Diagnosis made again with high IgE, eosinophilia, low TH17, remember that was the, patho uh, the pathophysiology, otherwise the leukocytes are normal, treatment is the same, antibiotics and IVIG. These last two are the complement deficiencies. Um, let's start with com terminal complement deficiency, so this is a problem with C5 to C9. These make up the membrane attack complex. So if you have a defect with these, the cell is unable to, um, to lyse other cells. This leaves you susceptible to gram-negative bacteria like Neisseria as the classic association. The treatment here is antibiotics, and you want to make sure these patients are vaccinated with the meningococcal vaccine. Um, that's terminal complement deficiency. Lastly, C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency. Um, this one isn't so much of a immune dysfunction, but it's related to the immune system with C1 esterase, so I've included it here. It's also known as hereditary angioedema. The pathophysiology is a mutation. It could be a de novo mutation, or it could be a uh, autosomal dominant uh, mutation in the C1 inhibitor. So you've lost the inhibitor. Um, because you've lost the inhibitor, you have excess bradykinin. Fluid accumulates in the skin and mucosa, and that's the swelling that you see here. The symptoms, as I mentioned, swelling uh, of the face, of the extremities, of the GI tract, of the airways. This can be recurrent. It can last for a while, up to three days. There's no identifiable triggers. Some say trauma or stress, but it's not like the other high bradykinin um, triggered swelling, like from ACE inhibitors. Um, there's, this is distinct from anaphylaxis because they don't have itchiness and they don't have like wheels. They don't have um, urticaria. Uh, it doesn't look like they have hives. Um, they're not, this isn't an allergic or IgE mediated um, process, so antihistamines aren't going to do anything. They can have GI manifestations because they have swelling in the GI tract, so they can be nauseous, they can have vomiting, diarrhea, and pain. Um, the respiratory tract can uh, also spasm and swell up. This can lead to an airway obstruction. There's, as I mentioned, no increased risk of infection, um, but it's related to the complement, so that's why I've included it here. Diagnosis is made by measuring the C1 inhibitor protein, and if those levels are low than suspect C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency. Um, treatment is fresh frozen plasma, which would contain that C1 inhibitor. You can also give C1 inhibitor concentrates, and there are also some bradykinin antagonists that you can give as well, and that's like a catabint. So that's it for these uh, primary immunodeficiency disorders. I hope this review was helpful, and thank you for listening.